Okay. Welcome everyone to New York Buddha Dharma. We're looking for a new name uh, because for the foreseeable future, I think we're going to be online. And um, I personally am moving to Colorado. <laughs> I lived there for 30 years from 1970 to 2000, and I have two daughters there. And um, Robin and I, I mean, Valerie and I are going to uh, move back. But it'll still, we'll still maintain all of this at the same hours, or maybe it will change, who knows, to meet people's convenience. And um, it's going to be an online group for as long as I can see now for the foreseeable future, but who knows, maybe we'll get back together in the flesh at some point. Um, I also want to let you know that we're going to take August off. Um, this is a long tradition in New York Buddha Dharma and Westchester Buddhist Center both. Um, Westchester Buddhist Center is about to be no more. And um, it's going to be another organization as well as this one. And um, we've always taken August off and it just works very well. Uh, is because of my move, I'm going to take advantage of that. So we'll start again after this session in September and we'll keep going with the same syllabus. And eventually um, we will finish this syllabus and we'll probably move on to the profound treasury of the ocean of Dharma. How many people here have read or studied that? Anybody? Well, uh, that's good. That means it's, oh, you have Leanne. Um, well, it's going to be pretty much fresh ground for everybody. And not only that, I find with all these things <laughs> that you go back over them again and again, and every time you do, it feels like, for me anyhow, like I've never seen it before. And new things um, present themselves. So we'll do that. It's uh, quite terrific, The Profound Treasury. It's actually the name of the book, it's three volumes, uh, is a pun, as it were, because um, what happened was that my teacher uh, was Chögyam Trungpa Rinpoche. And uh, starting in 1973, every year, but one or two maybe, he took his students um, away for three months. Uh, he took a group anywhere from maybe 125 up to 250. And uh, we would go and rent some resort area in the, in the off season. The first one was held in Teton Village, Jackson Hole, Wyoming in September. And so the facility was cheap uh, because nobody was skiing yet. And um, he would teach continuously for those three months. And he did that um, 13 times, 13 different years, and presented beautiful and very in-depth teachings. Um, one of his students, Judy Leaf, edited all of those transcripts of those talks and digested them into these three volumes. They take up about six feet on a, a, a shelf, <laughs> the transcripts, but now they're in these three volumes. And the reason they're called the profound treasury of the ocean of Dharma is because that was his name, Chogyam Trungpa. Chogyam was his refuge name, which we're gonna be talking about tonight, refuge and, and a refuge name. And it was an abbreviation of the full name, which is Chiki Gyamso which literally means ocean of Dharma. And so this is the profound treasury of the ocean of Dharma that we'll be doing probably in the fall. Um, just a quick question. Who here, if anyone, has taken refuge? Ah, okay, Tony, Tony and Leanne. So for everyone else, it's new ground. And frankly, um, this material, I find it so beautiful. And I read it in preparation for tonight. <laughs> I felt like I was learning it anew. Every time you come back to it, you see it through fresh eyes because your experience keeps evolving and your understanding keeps evolving over the years. And you go back and you hear these words with fresh ears and a fresh mind and hear new things in them. 
So we'll start. Um, we're going to go through a few chapters, some different readings. And we have done ref the refuge ceremony before. And if any of you are inspired and you let me know, um, we can do it again online. Taking refuge is, in some ways, the Buddhist version of confirmation for Christians, um, bar or bas mitzvah for Jews. Um, it means that you formally resolve to become a Buddhist. And so the simplest take on its meaning is that instead of shopping around and trying different things for spirituality, you're going to focus your attention and your efforts on the Buddhist path. Or as someone said once, instead of digging a lot of shallow holes, you're going to dig one deep one. And you've chosen this one. So taking refuge represents that. Um, it's a funny name, taking refuge, because we're not really going for protection. Really what we're doing is we're finding inspiration in the path. And one takes refuge in three, the three jewels that are called of Buddhism. One takes refuge in the Buddha as the example. One takes refuge in the Dharma as the instructions. These are the teachings. And one takes refuge in the Sangha. The Sangha is the community of fellow practitioners on the path. Really the reason you're, you want to take refuge is that you want to make a commitment to, associate yourself with, wakefulness, a waking from confusion. So it's just like when we were meditating a few minutes ago. You see that you are lost in some anxious daydream about the past or the future. And as soon as you see it, you're awake. And you can come back into this present moment, letting go of that dream. That's really the path over and over again is noticing that we're lost in a dream. And these dreams are always about I, the hero or the heroine. That's the only place I lives. The only place I lives is in those dreams, those thoughts. Because when you're back in awareness, I is gone. It's just this, the space, these phenomena arising and passing. And when we are lost in these thoughts about I, they are very dramatic. That's the, what keeps I alive, is the drama. The drama of will I, it's like, like, it's like uh, in the 19th or 18th century, whenever it was, you know, those, um, they had these traveling shows that went around the United States to entertain people before there was radios and televisions. And uh, the classic drama was The Perils of Pauline. And they would act it out, these actors, and they would, and Pauline would wind up at the end of each episode being tied to the railroad tracks and the train is coming and the evil villain is cackling away and will the hero get there fast enough to save her? And you're going, oh no, 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 you know, <laughs> get there. You know? And that's the really, we are living the perils of Pauline in our dreams. Only it's, we're Pauline each one of us. We're the hero, the heroine. So these dreams are fraught, fraught with anxiety, tension, hope and fear, judgment. And most of all, they're fraught with self-attack because what they're all about, these dreams, is self-improvement. And when you feel that you need to improve yourself, that means something's wrong with yourself. The very attitude that I need to make myself better, get enlightened, be happier, get richer, whatever it is, implies the flip side of that, that there's something wrong with me. I'm stupid, I'm not enlightened, I'm lonely, I'm poor, whatever it might be. This is seen in Buddhism as the number one evil. It's called the evil spirit, you might call it, the Gelgon in Tibetan. And it's wisdom's job to slay the Gelgon, slay this self-attack, 
slay this constant desire for self-improvement, which is a, a form of self-attack. And it makes us, when we think we're getting somewhere, then we might become elated momentarily as we feel like we're progressing towards our dream. But that's rare and far, far and few between. And usually we're depressed that we're not getting in what we want. And depression is the number one sign of the prevalence of the Gelgon, self-attack. So what taking refuge is, is you're beginning to commit yourself to killing the Gelgon. How do you kill the Gelgon? With wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is seeing what is, seeing what is in this present moment, because that's what is. The rest of it is fiction, dreams of the past and the future. And that's the way we, we uh, kill the Yelgon. We come back into this present moment again and again. Trungpa Rinpoche once said, the process of the path is a matter of shifting one's loyalty from those pernicious, anxiety-ridden dreams to awareness in the present. And that's a heck of a shift because when we come into the present, we are giving up all reference points of self-improvement, all reference points of where we're going. We're just resting, abiding in this space and beginning to enjoy it. So taking refuge is we are committing ourselves to this. And he calls it committing oneself to freedom. Freedom from the Gelgong, freedom from depression, freedom from these anxiety-ridden thoughts of the past and the future that are all about improvement. Always fictions that we get lost in. And it takes a lot of practice to shift one's loyalty because we've developed habits these habits are deep inside our unconscious, to use a Freudian term. In, the Tibetan Buddhism, in Buddhism, they call it the alia, the storehouse. It's where memory resides, memories of past events. And those events can be events in your life. They can be memories of dreams that you've had. And they come up again and again. We're habituated to them. And so we're breaking these bad habits and coming back to awareness. This is what it means to take refuge. Trump Rinpoche also liked to say that when you take refuge, you are becoming a refugee. You know? That means that you are adopting the path of loneliness, of aloneness. Loneliness could be a complaint, but aloneness is tough enough. And it's aloneness because we're not relying on anything else, on the hopes and the fears. We're giving them up. And every time we give them up and we come back into this present, we are asserting freedom. Freedom from the tyranny of thought, from the tyranny of these habitual patterns. There was a great saint in the 11th century, 11th, 12th, um, Milarepa. In fact, I thought I saw a picture of Milarepa. Maybe it was somewhere else. I thought maybe somebody had him, had him in the background of their Zoom. And um, he was a great yogi. And he constantly inveighed against, complained about, cursed what are called the namdaks. Namdaks are the habitual patterns that arise unbidden in our minds again and again. And they enslave us. They seduce us into wishing things were otherwise, which is very painful. So taking refuge is a commitment to freedom, freedom from that neurosis. He says, when we take the refuge vow, we end our shopping in the spiritual supermarket and commit to this brand, the Buddhist path. Well, when he said that back in the day, um, Hinduism was abroad, you know, the Satguru and um, all kinds of people, you know, Swami Satchitananda and uh, all kinds of Hinduism and people were teaching Christianity and mystical Christianity and all kinds of things. It was sort of a spiritual supermarket back in the late 60s and 
into the 70s. And so he's talking about we're giving up this kind of shopping and we're going to commit, commit to the Buddhist path, which is really a commitment to waking up, to being here in the present. He says it may seem harsh, but it's actually very compassionate for ourselves. By taking refuge, he says, we become homeless refugees in some sense. We are not helpless people handing our problems to someone else to handle. We are giving up our attachment to security, our sense of home ground, which is illusory anyway. And that is a big one. Because when you take refuge, when you begin to give up your attachment to dreams, this present moment is groundless. It has no beginning or end. It has no start or finish. It's just a constant display of awareness with things arising in it. And if we give up that sense of purpose, then we are floating in space. There used to be a tagline that people were putting on emails, a quote from Trungpa Rinpoche. He said, the quote went, the bad news is we're falling through centerless space. The good news is there is no ground. <laughs> I always like to quote, if you haven't heard it, I really recommend go to YouTube and listen to Eric Idle sing the galaxy song. And if you wish, and you, go, go, you search for it, you can even find Eric Idle singing of the Monty Python fame, singing the galaxy song with Stephen Hawking, the famous physicist. The two of them sing it together. And it ends with how extraordinarily infinite this universe is. And that it just keeps on expanding and expanding as he says, in all of the directions it can whiz, as fast as it can go, the speed of light, you know, 12 million miles a minute, and that's the fastest speed there is. <laughs> that's the last verse. <laughs> and it's just expanding infinitely. I mean, where are we? We think we're going from point A to point B. There is no point A or point B. It's imaginary. <laughs> we're in the middle of centerless space. And this is what meditation is it's coming back, giving up these reference points into total awareness in centerless space. He says, we don't, we don't actually have any home, fundamentally speaking. There is actually no solid basis of securities in one's life. We are lost souls, so to speak. <laughs> but becoming a Buddhist means relating to lost and confused. We are more open. We begin to see that we can't grasp onto anything. Everything continually washes out. So it's acknowledging that we are homeless, groundless, and it's acknowledging that there is really no need for home or ground. It's an expression of freedom taking refuge. Because as refugees, we're no longer bounded by the need for security. We are suspended in no man's land. The only thing to do is to relate with the teachings in ourselves. I mean, we think that we, we're, we're finding security, but it's so temporary. Maybe you find financial security, and then a crash happens and you lose your money. Maybe you think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm healthy, and then something happens and you're not anymore. Where do you get to be 75? I, I'm looking around and I see so many of my friends dying. It's amazing. Every week I find out somebody else has passed. I'm just, my Tong Len list, that's the compassion practice that we can do in meditation, gets longer and longer as I'm doing Tong Len for people who have passed as well as people who are suffering in this life. It's just wild. And there's a slogan. When you begin to do Vajrayana practice, tantric practice, you'll do something called the four reminders. These are called the four common preliminaries. And you'll chant them and you'll contemplate them. The four reminders go like this. Here's one version of them anyhow. There's are longer and shorter versions. Joyful to have such a human birth. 
difficult to find free and well-favored, meaning we're not crippled, lame, halt, blind. But death is real, comes without warning. This body will be a corpse. I've got a t-shirt that I used to wear to the gym once in a while when I was brave enough. Big black t-shirt with white letters. It just says, this body will be a corpse. <laughs> Fun to walk around a gym with that. Very interesting. And death is real, comes without warning. That's the, those are the first two reminders. I had a close friend. His name was David Gorevich. David was a criminal lawyer, very successful. He was constantly trying to go over to the good side. He did a lot of work in Africa, uh, trying to stop human trafficking, to sort of make up for all the criminals, the crooks he defended, because they paid so well. He mostly Wall Street guys. He said of them, I know they're crooks. They know I know they're crooks. He tried to go, he worked for the DA's office for a while, but you, you make bupkis working for a DA. So David, very kindly, funded the creation of New York Buddha Dharma. He put up the money for the incorporation of the very group that we're in right now and for getting our 501c3 nonprofit status. He funded that. David and I used to have lunch or dinner once or twice a month. Really loved the guy. Last November, I got a call from his ex-wife. David had a vacation home on a lake in Pennsylvania. And uh, he was divorced and he had a girlfriend or two and they'd come and visit him there. And on a Sunday morning, one of his girlfriends arrived at that house and found it burned to the ground with him in it. I still can't believe it. A few weeks ago, I noticed that I had voicemail that I hadn't looked at in months. It was it's on a, a Google voice number that I don't use anymore. So I went in and listened to the voicemail. And there was David asking me to lunch. It is totally eerie. Death is real, comes without warning. This body will be a corpse. We feel like we have, we, we can sort of make things good, but really we are floating in centerless space. And we try to pretend with our dreams of the past and the future that we are going from point A to point B. But there is no point A or point B, <laughs> they're fictions. So he says, the refuge ceremony marks the beginning of an odyssey of loneliness. However, it also includes the inspiration of the lineage in the form of the preceptor. If I give you refuge, I'm the preceptor and I will represent the lineage for better or for worse. The lineage of people, when we did that chant that, uh, at the beginning of meditation, um, great Vajradhara, Telo, Naro, and Marpa, Mila, Lord of Dharma, Gampopa, that's the lineage chant going all the way back to the primordial Buddha beyond any human being, Vajradhara. He wasn't a human. And then the first human in the lineage, Talopa, great Vajradhara, Telo, Naro, and Marpa. That's Talopa, Naropa, and Marpa, the first Tibetan. And there's this lineage of this passing down the teachings of waking up for 2,600 years from the time, and even before, before, for millennia, many millennia. And we are part of that stream. Trungpa Rinpoche always made it clear, he regarded himself as a representative of the lineage. He said that the power of the lineage is what is coming through in these teachings. And to the extent that you connect with it, it makes sense to you, you practice it, it changes your life for the better, you are connecting to that lineage of people going back and back and back. It's a lot of fun to read their biographies. You begin to fall in love with these people. Padmasambhava, we did the seven line supplication to him. His main disciple was a, a woman named Yeshe Tsogyal. And together they planted teachings. Padmasambhava and Yeshe Tsogyal knew that they had teachings which were not appropriate for the people of their time. 
So they planted them, they hid them. These are called terma, which means hidden treasures. And they knew by whom they would be found and when, hundreds of years into the future. People are still finding terma today. There are great teachers out there who are tertans, they're called, and they discover these terma. Sometimes these terma are physical objects, like a text. Sometimes it might just be a statue that could be buried miraculously inside of solid rock. And the tertan, the treasure revealer, reaches into the rock and pulls it out. And when they touch it, the teachings connected with it flow into them and they have to write it down very quickly. If it's a text, they see the text and the text is written in what's called Dakini script. Dakinis are these female energies of enlightened mind that fly through the air and they speak in a, a language of their own. And these texts are written in Dakini script. And when, as the Tertan sees them and reads them, they evaporate into thin air. So he has to write it down very quickly as he reads it. These are all part of the tradition that you're getting yourself involved in. It's a, a tradition out of time, out of space, and out of the constraints of logical reasoning mind. So it says we have to work on ourselves with the sense of sacredness and richness and the magical quality of our experience. Usually we're so lost in thoughts about the past and the future, thoughts of judgment, good and bad, that we don't actually appreciate what we're experiencing in this present moment because these phenomena arise so beautifully and so vividly. And if one has the eyes to see, they say, that this realm that we're in is a heavenly palace peopled by gods and goddesses, that's us. But we just see it as a veil of tears, to use a phrase from the Bible. Hmm. That you experience loneliness, aloneness, that there is no savior, no help, though there is a sense of belonging to a tradition of loneliness where people work together. And we're gonna to come to that more. And the ceremony, taking refuge is important because it marks your commitment. It's important to eat to you, to nobody else but you. You're marking your commitment to yourself, to work on yourself and tread the path to sanity. He says, when you take refuge, become a refugee, a follower of the Buddha's teaching, you get onto a train that is without reverse and without brakes. <laughs> he, he always liked to say that kind of thing. And here's a good one. So the refuge ceremony is the landmark of becoming a Buddhist, which is a non-theist. That means Buddhism doesn't involve any belief in external deities of any kind. Now, you have to be careful with this because Buddhism is not atheism. Atheism is another belief. Buddhism just wants nothing to do with beliefs. The most common form of belief is theism, that you believe in some external deity that's going to help you, save you. And that's just not there in Buddhism. But atheism, that you believe that God doesn't exist, that's just another belief too. And you, Buddhism recommends throw them all out and just rely on your experience of coming back into this present moment. That's what makes us sane. So taking refuge in the Buddha, not as a savior, but as an example of someone you can emulate. He says, an ordinary person, an ordinary person, who saw through the deceptions of life and found the awakened state of mind by relating with the confusion, chaos, and insanity around him. He saw through the deceptions of life and found the awakened state of mind. instead of blaming anything else, 
for his woes. Society, Trump, you name it. You know, even things like, well, all kinds of things. He worked on himself and achieved Bodhi, awakening, enlightenment, the final ultimate breakthrough. And he was able to teach it to others. And that is the path of sanity. That is the path of compassion and of opening ourselves to all the sentient beings of this world. He was an ordinary human being. We tend to put him up on a pedestal. We say, oh, he must have been a very great person. You know, and I'm just this ordinary little human being. But he is an example of what it means to be an ordinary human being. We all, I remember, I remember when Rinpoche taught, first taught this, he looked out at us and he said, you all want to be extraordinary. Like that. <laughs> and it wasn't a good thing that he was talking about. He was saying that the point is to become an ordinary human being, a citizen of this planet, walking the earth with compassion and love for one's fellow man and fellow sentient beings of all kinds. He says, in taking refuge, you realize that you can actually compete with the Buddha who felt alienated from his basic sanity so he left his home, his kingdom, he was a king or a prince, and practiced meditation in jungles and had friends and teachers who were all confused people just like him, using meditation to fortify the ego. And he tried all kinds of gimmicks and they didn't work. So he left the others and he found his own way. says he won victory over both psychological and spiritual materialism. Materialism is the constant desire to enrich oneself in one way or another, to make things better. And there are three modalities. There's the materialism of form, of speech, and of mind. If we're formal materialists, then we manipulate our physical surroundings, hoping that that will make us happy. And the easiest way or the most common way is we pursue wealth. But you can also flip it and you can pursue simplicity. I mean, I remember, you know, back in the 60s when we had that slogan, you never own anything more than you can fit in your Volkswagen bug, you know. And uh, Gary Snyder went out and, you know, built himself a little Zen cabin out in, um, near Mount Tamil Pius and listened to the sound of water dripping from the big bamboo. And, um, you can you know, achieve complete simplicity and that can be a form of spiritual materialism. The Lord of speech, speech, uh, ideological materialism has to do with thinking that you're going to make things better by subscribing to a particular philosophy, which could even be Buddhism. Then you become a true believer and you try to order your life according to that philosophy. And you do a violence to others because you think that anybody who doesn't believe as you do is a barbarian. And the Lord of Mind has to do with manipulating mind uh, through trance states, primarily in the Buddhist tradition, to achieve some kind of bliss, but they're all temporary and they're selfish and they're self-absorbed. So when you take refuge, like the Buddha, you're turning away from that kind of materialism and turning towards awareness openness to this world as it arises now, our lives. He says, one of the big steps in the Buddha's development was realizing that there is no reason to believe in anything. <laughs> Not relying on an external divine principle, regarding himself as an ordinary person. If we possess Buddha nature, we don't have to borrow someone else's glory. We have our own resources already. It is very much up to us. I'm gonna pause at this point. There's too little more to go, uh, the Dharma and the Sangha. 
Does anybody have any comments or questions? Instead of me just plowing on. Trip. So uh, I've heard you say often cheer up uh, in various guided meditations. And I'm curious what role optimism as like I distinct distinguishing from faith, but what role optimism plays in all of this? Is there, is there such a, you know, in, in the Buddhist path, does it exist? Cheering up is, Hard to do. <laughs> Remember that song? It's breaking up. But um, it's different than optimism. Optimism could be Pollyanna, you know, a dream of the future that's positive, that makes you feel good for the moment while you're having the dream. Cheering up is coming back into the present moment and enjoying it, appreciating the beauty of it and the humor that we always have. And also really taking pleasure in the people around us, in our contact with them. Then we begin to cheer up in a genuine way. And that's very important that taking pleasure in the people around us, that's part of the Bodhisattva path, which is coming even further down than, than taking refuge. That we begin to actually become really good friends with people and enjoy them, appreciate them, each one in their own idiosyncratic difference. So cheering up is coming out of the doldrums of these depressed, hopeful, wishful, fearful thoughts. It's like a miasma, a cloud that we could walk around in, a cloud of depression, a cloud that Gelgong creates you know, that spirit of self-attack. It's giving up self-attack. And it's flip side, self-improvement. They go together, those two. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great, great thing to bring up. Cheering up is hard. <laughs> he used to say to us, he used to sit in his chair and look out and he said, please cheer up. Please cheer up. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Mary, you're muted, I think. Can't hear you. You're not muted. No, yes, you are. You're muted. There you go. Must be something with your microphone. Can you check your volume on your, do you have a volume key on your computer keyboard? You're muted again. Now you're not. So you look for that volume key on the keyboard. Shows a picture of a microphone. I mean, a loudspeaker. Okay. Mary, you should type your question. I'd really like to hear it. Yeah, type or put your question in chat. Thank you, Tony. That was great. <laughs> Try to uh, comment. Arrow uh -huh. and uh, down arrow. Mary, you're unmuted. You just maybe meet, need to put your volume up. Up arrow, down arrow. Up for increased volume, down for decreased volume. Um, my, that happened to me one time. Well, write your comment or question, whatever it was, in chat. And I'll watch for it. And while she's doing that, anyone else? I hope you're going to do it, Jim. Mary. 
It's really all, all, all about coming back into the present moment. Call it coming home. It's where we live. It's what is real. And that's what this path is all about. Coming home. Coming back to reality, which is always here. It's just that we depart from it and get lost in our dreams, which are so pernicious, ultimately. Okay, I'm going to go on and Mary, if you type your question, we'll get to it. So the Dharma, these are the teachings. Um, everything in our life is a constant process of learning and discovery. That's the way we take it. That this is the true Dharma. When you come back into the present moment, ah, Karen. Hi, yeah. Okay. So I'm curious about uh, taking refuge. The way you're talking about it now, about coming back into the present moment, sounds like it's about the practice of meditation, or the path of meditation. But when I was close to taking refuge, I had the sense, the closer I got to that possibility, the, the more I had the sense that it was really about committing to a particular strand of Buddhism via a particular tradition or teacher. And that seemed not just culturally specific, but um, ritually specific in a way that um, felt more perhaps narrow or, or specific. I think narrow sounds pejorative and I don't mean it that way. I mean, um, it, it means particular. I, I want to mean that it's particular rather than philosophical. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm curious if how you yeah. would um, comment on that because I I felt sort of disappointed when I had that perception because I thought oh it's not about meditation or reality it's about this particular tradition. Um, I would disagree with that because your commitment to any particular tradition or individual as a teacher has to be very real. It's not a matter of joining a club or of you know, signing up under somebody's aegis or protection because you want to adopt the name somehow. I'm a student of so-and-so. It's really a matter of communication. Communication with you, with your sanity and your neurosis. And when it speaks to you, you know, that way, that make you automatically commit because it's meaningful. You can still make a commitment to the path because you appreciate the principles of Buddhism and meditation and because you've met a group of people or some different groups of people that you enjoy or you feel like you can profitably work with. And you can still take refuge for those reasons. But the actual commitment to specific individuals or specific lineages that has to be real. That has to mean that you've connected with your heart and your mind and it's, it's become meaningful to you. The most, especially when you talk about the teacher, the most important thing about the relationship with the teacher is open communication. When that's there, it happens automatically. That, that link, that connection. And when it's not, then the teacher's an instructor and that's, that can be helpful, but it's not, it's, it's, it's less gripping, less meaningful. It doesn't hold you the same way. You can get instructions from lots of people. So in a way you're saying that um, you encounter teachers who happen to be in particular lineages or traditions, but when you make a heart connection that transcends tradition and lineage because it's so open that it's not, um, it's not about anything but that complexity of connection. Yes. 
Yes. The deepest part of the Buddhist teachings is communicated through deep friendship, <laughs> complete openness between people. When the barriers drop, when that happens, it's magic. And then the connection is really powerful and solid. But you could still, you know, just by liking it intellectually because you see the, the, be the benefits of practicing meditation, that it calms your mind, that it makes you saner, you know, what they, because you aren't convinced of the truth of these teachings, you could make a commitment to become a Buddhist. But that doesn't mean that you are committing to any specific lineage or teacher. That has to be real. That needs to be real. So and when it happens, when you, it transcends everything. When you were just making that distinction between committing, between committing to becoming a Buddhist and committing to a particular teacher or lineage, are both of those taking refuge or is only one of them taking refuge? Like when both, you take they're, refuge... They're both part of taking refuge, but you yeah. might take refuge without ever having had a really deep connection with a teacher yet. And that can happen or it might not happen in this lifetime. And yet you still might be connecting very powerfully to meditation, to the truth of the intellectual teachings. And that might all make, make sense to you and help you with your life. Not everybody meets the teacher, as it were, in this lifetime. But one thing is for sure, if you expose yourself to different ones, you know, maybe there's more chance. It's a really, it's kind of like, uh, you know, um, you find a mate and there's magic in it. No, the other person can be standing right next to you and they don't see any magic, but you do in that person and they become your mate. It's a connection. It's almost chemical. Yeah, it's what makes sense for you and moves you and inspires you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. It's a very deep question. But I mean, you can take refuge anywhere. You could go to Bangkok. You can walk down the street and there are monks there and you can just go up to a guy and say, can I take refuge? And he'll give you refuge. You know, and then you give him a donation. <laughs> you can do it like that. It's... You know. So, the Dharma. Um, he says, we develop the sense that it is worthwhile to walk on the earth. Uh, all life is regarded as a fertile and learning situation. Everything is path. Everything is Dharma. And we study the intellectual teachings because they, they open up our minds, just like that kind of discussion we just had. And I feel like you, all, you knew that, you know, that you're just waiting to hear it that kind of thing. But we need to do that. That's what the teachings do. We hear them, we say, oh, yes, I knew that. That makes sense. He says, absence of deception, politeness, and the Dharma is directly facing the facts of life, experiencing life directly without cheap politeness. Pain is pain, pleasure is pleasure, and confusion is... Huh, And getting into these, into life accompanied by meditation. And that's the path. And it makes the whole thing clearer and more precise. He says this, taking refuge in the Dharma, the teachings, means that the experiences that go through your life, pain and pleasure alike, are also sacred teachings. And this is so true. Everything becomes a teaching. Because you can bring the clarity of awareness to absolutely everything in life. Isn't that what they say? When the student is ready, the teacher appears? There's that too. And uh, the student is really ready. Everything is the teacher. Indeed. You know, 
looking out there, all these faces, Hudson River, teacher. I'm looking out my window now. Ooh, and then, of course, there's the statue of Jesus over there across the street. It's kind of ironic, but uh, there you go. Why not? But I had a question about, you know, what you mentioned the Dakinis. Uh, what is it about the Dakinis that are not an external, you know, why is a Dakini not like God, an external deity uh, that, uh, is, that there's something something not so good about an external God, but the mm. Dakini seem to be fine. Well, like everything else, you know, we regard each other as being external, but from a non-dual point of view, everything that has appears is just a manifestation of mind. There is no internal or external. So it's all projection, so take your pick, right? If you, it's projection when you think that it's external, yes, and that there's an I here and a thing over there. Right. But there actually it's part of a matrix that's constantly shifting you know, and constantly changing its center and focus. Mm -hmm. And Dakini's, what Dakini represents is an energy aspect. There are two main um, energies like this. One is Daka, which is male, and then there's Dakini, which is female. And the Dakini energy um, has different levels uh, from mundane. A, an ordinary human being can be Dakini. And um, men can have Dakini energy. Dakini energy is feminine. It's full of color. It's unpredictable. It's mischievous. And it's dangerous. Daka, which is male energy, and women can have male energy. You know, it's, it's not... Can, you know, confined to the se any particular sex, is cold, logical, predictable, and relatively safe. <laughs> relatively. But, and then there are different levels of Dakini. Um, there's the human Dakini, meaning you can meet someone, uh, um, uh, a person in the flesh, who's just animated with that energy. And then there's um, um, Dakini energy that's sort of part of the natural environment, um, like storms and lightning and, um, you know, all kinds of things, flashing uh, of the, the light of the sunset and who knows what. And then there's um, Dakini, which is, um, you could say deity. deity. Deity means, you know, they're gods in Buddhism. They're just, they're not different from you and me. They've just got different powers, you know, but they're not worthy of worship. The gods actually are sort of dumb jocks. <laughs> stand up there in the in the heavens, they're too absorbed in pleasure, and uh, they're beautiful and they're um, everything they you know they're just absorbed in pleasure for a while. But they're still part of confusion, and so are Dakinis when they are, are in human form. They're definitely still part of confused world. They're not necessarily enlightened, but they represent energies. And when they talk about Padmasambhava and that chant that we did at the beginning. You know, um, um, in the northwest of the land of Uddiyana on a blooming lotus flower. You see, he was born. He represents our self-enlightenment. The fact that we're already enlightened, our enlightened nature, our Buddha nature. That's what Padmasambhava is. Because he was born at the age of seven, enlightened, on a lotus, in a lake, <laughs> in, in what is now probably um, Afghanistan, in the Swat, what's probably the Swat Valley of Afghanistan. And he says, so in the northwest of the land of Udiyana, think Afghanistan, on a blooming lotus flower, you have attained supreme wondrous Siddhi. Siddhis are powers. And there are two kinds of Siddhi, ordinary and supreme. Ordinary Siddhis, you know, if you can lift 350 pounds, that's a Siddhi, you know. Um, if you can uh, um, uh, recite Pi out to 100 places, that's a city, you know. Uh, if you can 
read minds. That's a city. But the ultimate city is enlightenment itself. So you have achieved supreme wondrous city. That means enlightenment. Surrounded by your retinue of many dakinis. These are the energies of life that the enlightened person plays with continually. That's how it goes. That's the uh, the second noble truth, isn't it? Uh, impertinence. Impertinence, right? <laughs> That's good. Thank you, Graham. You're welcome. Okay, we'll go on. Finally, the sangha. We'll talk about the sangha. Maybe we'll talk. I'm going to stop after the sangha, and we'll do the rest of this talk next week because it's getting late. But the main thing about the sangha is this is we're sangha. This is sangha here. We're friends. We're fellow practitioners. We can see each other's virtues and failings, our ignorance and our intelligence, and we work with it. We're treading the path alone together. That's the key to Sangha. If the Sangha is a bunch of friends, people who are working on themselves, treading the path alone together. That way, if you do that, then if somebody slips and falls, the person next to them can reach down and help them up because they're not leaning on them. You're, each one of us is independent, standing on our own two feet. And they say of the Sangha that it becomes as powerful a teacher as the teacher, or as the Buddha, who represents the Buddha. And that it's involved in a continual learning process. I think, um, for me, the most important thing about the Sangha is the quality of friendship and enjoyment of each other and affection and working together. The morning meditation group, some of you are part of that. We're going to start doing more things afterwards. Um, Alexandra Shenpen is going to do a presentation on Kado, the path of flowers. She teaches it. She's a sensei, actually, has the title of sensei in the Japanese tradition. And, um, and then we've got, you know, we were Zoom bombed um, a few weeks ago. And the Zoom bombers were very, very, not only were they vulgar and, you know, pornographic, but they were racist. And there are a number of people who are very upset. And we're going to get together after meditation and have a discussion about what we might do, some of us who want to, together, uh, to develop, to, to approach or do something besides meditate uh, to make a contribution to this issue of racism in this country, which certainly needs attention and addressing. So there'll be more and more, and there are lots of opportunities for people in Sangha, you, to come forward with your inspirations and find people of similar mind and work together with them to do worthy things. Might be something artistic like the path of flowers, kado. Might be something out of, because you're moved out of friendship and love for your fellow man. All kinds of things that we can do. And that's really a big part of Sangha. He says, um, you're willing to work together with your loneliness in a group. Thousands of people alone together, working with their loneliness, their own aloneness. It's very important that we maintain our individual integrity, our aloneness. He says, I'll close with this. You might seek extraordinary friends and pursuits, but somehow those turn out to be purely plastic, dream world, so that you return to the real Sangha, the real people who actually care about themselves, care about you as a friend, and relate with the whole situation completely without any areas shielded through a consensus of weakness. 
we could stop there. Mary put her question in chat. Oh, good one. Thank you. Here's Mary's question. Is it? Cheer up sounds shallow, sounds shallow and negative to me. Would find joy work? Mm. Yeah. I'm just, I get a little leery about joy because it's so extreme. You know, like, sounds like ecstatic, like I'm going to have an orgasm. Um, but cheering up just sounds like, you know, being here awake, ready for anything. Um, but yeah, I like your point. It could be shallow too, you know. So however you find it, what it means is not giving in to depression at all. No depression. Instead, finding life worth being here for. Full of heart. An opportunity for engagement, creativity, and friendship. Friendship. So important, isn't it? I mean, cheering up sort of sounds like happy facing it through the day. Okay. But uh, uh, I always thought cheer up was like, uh, he probably picked that up in, uh, in England. Or, you know, cheer up, that's a very Brit kind of. <laughs> that's yeah. a good thought, I, entirely possible. That's why I always thought it was like, cheer up, it's very short and to the point and, you know, kind of hits you. Keep a stiff upper lip. It reminds me of the study of biofeedback and specifically facial feedback and the idea that the muscles in your face influence uh, the chemicals in your brain. Smiling actually does make you cheer up. Ooh. Yeah, I found that. Isn't it really weird that when you're feeling down, if you force a grin like this, something changes. <laughs> Everybody runs away. <laughs> right. There's that too. Great. <laughs> Weird. But they have to be able to see you first. Yeah. I can't see you. <laughs> A couple of the experiences that I had with um with Sangha were that uh for me it helped it helped to keep me honest in a lot of different sorts of situations. And the other thing that it did was it helped to keep me right-sized. So... What does that mean? Well, right-sized in some terms, the fact that, you know, I didn't act out in some sort of egotistical way in a situation. You know, there were lots of checks and balances within the Sangha that, um, you know, are fostered, I think, by deep caring and friendship for each other as well on the path. So there are a couple of experiences that I had and do continue to have in different ways with the small sangha that I have. Hmm. Where's your small sangha? Connecticut? Up here in Connecticut, yeah. Okay. There's a few of us that sit and um, some are in the, on the Zen path and um, others have been involved in the Shambhala path for years. So they're few and far between, but there are enough to make it. Uh, I, I, I go to Karma Choling quite, I used to. So I was very familiar with a lot of people up there and that was a real part of my life for many years until the last couple of years. Mm. Uh, me too. It's an old, uh, old Zen, Zen uh, saying, said, said I think once in here before, <clears throat> an old Zen saying, uh, Cheer up, it gets worse. <laughs> That's good. 
That's good. Sense of humor is so important. Well, I fail to see the humor in that. <laughs> <laughs> Just gets funnier, Graham, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah. There's a whole chapter in cutting through on sense of humor. First time I ever heard Trungpa Rinpoche speak, mm. he came to New York and a friend of mine said, this is Tibetan Lama coming, so I went and heard him speak. And he walked in and I've been listening to Swamis and all kinds of people speaking. This guy walks in in a suit and a tie and he's got a blonde sitting next to him, that's his wife actually, uh, in a mini skirt that um, they're sitting in chairs and I'm sitting on the floor trying to be a yogi in full lotus and I'm trying not to look up her skirt. I can see her underwear, you know. <laughs> and uh, he gave a talk on sense of humor, which wasn't in the least bit funny. And I wrote him off. I said, he's not for me. <laughs> I wanted a few jokes, I guess. <laughs> well, friends, Nikki, you have anything to say? Want to complain about anything? <laughs> I'm, <clears throat> I'm sitting here quietly taking notes. Okay. I feel like um, I'm not quite as educated on this as everyone else. I mean, it, it all makes sense to me, but I feel like, you know, since this is volume two, I'm coming in the middle of a movie. And it makes sense, but I missed part one doesn't matter. You just keep going around and around and around. I mean, I'm teaching this stuff, right? After 50 years, <laughs> I'm still learning it as I go. It's, it's including tonight, you know, that refuge is about freedom. Wow. What an amazing statement that was when I read that and, you know, in reading these readings, taking refuge is a commitment to freedom. Freedom from one's own tyranny. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm certainly picking up on certain themes like awareness and okay. so it's hard for me to grasp that self-improvement that's drummed into us as having been a good thing is not really a good thing. <laughs> Doesn't mean that we don't do creative and worthwhile things. It's that egotism of the self-aggrandizement mm -hmm. and the self-improvement and its flip side, which is self-criticism. Because if you feel like you, you, need, you, you need improvement, what's it saying about where you are right now? Yep. That's great. Keep working with it. I mean, the main thing here is not to be smart, the main thing is to be working on oneself and finding something that's useful for all of us, I think. There is no smart. You know, there is no really knowing at all. <laughs> oh boy. Um, what time is the morning meditation? Um, right now, we have a difference. What's happening is that it's going to switch to nine o'clock every morning, starting August 1st. Um, this week is the last week. Um, what's today? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we'll meet at eight. And then from then on, Friday, Saturday on, um, we're going to start meeting at nine o'clock every morning. We start with 15 minutes of social conversation at 9.15 or 8.15 tomorrow and the next day. We start to practice. We do sitting meditation. We have 10 minutes of walking in there. We, we meditate, we practice for an hour from 8.15 or 9.15 for an hour. And during that time, we have 10 minutes of walking meditation. We also do 10 minutes of Tonglen practice, which is a compassion practice for those who wish. And if you don't wish, you just meditate. We offer meditation instruction and instruction in Tonglen in a separate breakout room People go off with an instructor while the rest of us sit. And then at the quarter after the hour, we end. And inevitably, people 
hang around and talk. And sometimes there are programs. Somebody wants to offer something. So Jane Sandbank um, on Wednesday last, was it? Uh, no, I think it was just yesterday. Gave a program, I couldn't go. On uh, emotional intelligence. She teaches this. She used to be superintendent of schools in Westchester. She is very connected with the Yale um, uh, department on, that works with, there's a school within Yale on emotional intelligence, and she ran a workshop on it, having to do with grief. And, um, and then on August 1st, Saturday, uh, Alexander is going to offer this workshop on Kado, an introduction to the art of flowers which she's been teaching for many, many years. And we do things like that as they arise. Is it the same Zoom um, number as this? Same, same Zoom number, same um, password, and the same process of being in a waiting room because we got Zoom bombed and it was pretty traumatic for some people. Yeah. It was really ugly. Yeah. So now we take more precautions. Thank you. You're welcome. Let me say a couple, a couple of things. Um, if you can make a donation, you know, for the evening to New York Buddha Dharma, um, ten dollars is suggested. I think we we suggest one hundred and eight for the series. If you're doing the whole series, um, and what else? There was something else I wanted to tell you. I don't know. There are programs that come from time to time, and I'll be sending them out to you if you're on our list. I think everybody here is. Yeah. Nikki, your name is Nicole, right? Yes. Okay, then you're on the list too. Um, and Emily, is that how do you pronounce it? Emily? And nice to meet you. Hi. I'll see you again. Okay. So Wait, I have a question. Yeah. is tomorrow's link the same? Yes. But tomorrow that's tomorrow you mean tomorrow evening? With... Tuesday evening? No. That's tomorrow's the last time we're gonna take a break. There's a Tuesday class. We're gonna break for August too. When we come back after August for all of these things, it'll be this link. But for tomorrow's class, for the Tuesday class, it's you have to go to Westchester Buddhist Center dot org. It's still yep. on there because yes. like their site changed. It is. It's still there. And okay. uh, it's still there till July 31st. And you go in Perfect. through that link for tomorrow's class. But after after uh, the 31st of July, it'll be this link for everything. Perfect. Thank you. At least for the time being. Okay. Well, a name for your new group came to mind Worldwide Open Way. Worldwide Open Way. Okay, I'm going to write that down. Graham, every time you talk, I think you're going to make a joke. <laughs> well, <laughs> can I tell you? <laughs> you just surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, worldwide. Thank you, Graham. Was it Graham you said that? Yeah, Graham. So Thank you. Graham. That was good. I also thought when you were talking at the very beginning about New York Buddha Dharma and then going online, why not just call it online Buddha Dharma? It's very plain. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. All right. So let's close with a dedication of merit. The, um, when you dedicate the merit, you're giving away all the benefit accrued through tonight's efforts, meditation, study, to other sentient beings. This is a Bodhisattva act, and including your own enlightenment. And as somebody, one teacher just uh, said once, he said, the dirty little secret is that when you give it away, you get it back faster. <laughs> yeah, you can't really do it that way. So there's a lot of chats in here. Wait a second. Will you repeat the book? The book is The Profound Treasury of the Ocean of Dharma. Judy Leaf edited it. 
three volumes. I would, if you're going to get it, just get volume one. It's not cheap. And volume three, last time I taught it was with Derek Collini and we agreed to stop about halfway through. It was just too much uh, for the students we had at the time. So we'll see. Okay, here comes the chat. And if you don't mute yourself, then we get cacophony, but that's okay. By this merit, may all obtain omniscience. May it defeat the enemy wrongdoing. From the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. From the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. By the confidence of the golden sun of the great east, may the lotus garden of the Rigdon's wisdom bloom. May the dark ignorance of sentient beings be dispelled. May all beings enjoy profound, brilliant glory. If anybody wants to um, talk about their meditation practice with me, just email me and we'll set up a time. There's nothing more important than your meditation practice or anything. Okay, everyone, thank you. Wonderful to see you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Nice seeing everyone. Bye.